Go get in your car and do your job, little doggy. He's a pig. Excuse me? I said he's a pig. God damn. He hates every law enforcement officer in the United States. All right. Please stand up, sir. This is trying to do justice. Here's the docket. He was convicted right here. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, there was a motion to create a standby counsel for his attorney, which is kind of an awkward thing to do. Uh, judges don't really like it because what you're saying is I'm competent enough to know the rules of evidence. So I'm going to be held to the same standards as a lawyer. If the maximum sentence is six months per charge, and the judge gives him six months as a first offender and six months for another one as his first first offender and then runs them consecutively. So that's a year in jail. That would generate its own appeal. And the uh, appellate courts might say, you know, in all the cases you've done, how did this guy get the you know heightened punishment? How did you give him the maximum? So the judges always play that game back. They anticipate a appeal. And they say, well, we gave him the mid-range sentence for each one. Well, then that's not an abuse of discretion. Surprise me was the consecutive sentences. I wasn't expecting that. Very hard to win an appeal on a misdemeanor case unless you really want to throw a lot of money at it. I was mentioning how uh, the, Nevada the Nevada statutes, in my opinion, this to me looked unconstitutional because it was too broad and too easy to subjectively bust somebody. I'm never in favor of a law like that because, like I said, an innocent person get busted. I only have a limited amount of time. I'm locked down 23 hours a day. So it's, every day is like a month, every minute is like an hour. It's absolutely horrifically bad, horrible. They won't let me have a book. There's no books allowed. There's no there's no pencils or pens allowed. You're in a room alone constantly for 24 hours a day. Yesterday they didn't give me an hour of free time, so I couldn't. I could only make a five minute call real quick, and I left you a voicemail. I have court on Monday. I need people to show up for me on Monday respectfully, calmly, quietly, look nice, look good, clean yourself up. Um, remember to try to be as calm and respectful as you can. It's at 200 Lewis Avenue. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm emotional. I only have one hour to try to get the message out to get people to actually show up. It'll mean a lot to me. Um, Monday is my, my appeal bond hearing. Um, I think Mr. Dick Heller will be there from Heller versus District of Columbia. Shake his hand. He's a tall, 82-year-old white guy with white hair. You can't miss him. You'll know who Dick Heller is just by looking at him, for his stature and demeanor. And I need people to show up. So this place is a nightmare. And it's, um, so it's, I can't give you the layout because I don't want to get in trouble for any security measures. But I can tell you this. We're all in individual little tiny rooms, one or two people in each room. And about 10 o'clock at night, from being locked down for 23 hours, if they get an hour of free time, people start to go crazy. They start to kick and hit the door and shake and scream. And the ventilation system where the air conditioning comes through, everybody knows that if you talk into the ventilation system, other people can hear you. So about 10 or 11, 12 o'clock at night, the last two nights, I don't know, feels like two months, people will start to talk into the ventilation uh, system saying, hey, somebody please talk to me. Somebody talk to me. And then there's a psych ward of women um, somewhere in the building. I can't say anything about the layout of the building. But then they'll go into the machine, into the fan, and start to sing horrible, horrible singing and start to, like, purr, like, try to get, like, some sort of romantic or flirtatious relationship. And then the guys walked up in here are dying for some sort of affection from anybody. So um, they will... Uh, Oh my God, I have limited time. I gotta get off this phone. I gotta go. I can't, I have only, I gotta call more people to get them to show up on Monday because I need that courtroom to be packed full of people so she knows that, that I have an effect on others, that people will show up. And uh, uh, it's just really hard. It's just really hard what I'm going through right now. I'm not gonna look so good when you see me on Monday. Uh, I've worn the same clothes for 10 days. I stink. I'm dirty. And um, I don't look good. Um, so no matter what happens, if I don't make it out of here, then you continue the mission to overturn Terry and to, to change the NRS code where people only get one hour of free time a day at least. Got to get 
cameras in the courtroom. We've got to overturn Terry versus Ohio. Got to get rid of the tortured house. Got to get rid of them. They're terrible. And they use them in here constantly. I can't give the layout. You go from place to place and they put you in torture cuffs when you go from place to place as though you're going to try to escape. If you get away from them here, there's another level of security and another level, and there's multiple levels of security that's not giving anything away. So you can't escape, but they still put you in torture cuffs. Listen, I can't talk. I got to go. I got to call some people. I'm going to call some people and hope that um, there'll be some people there on Monday. And remember, if you show up, please be respectful and calm and together. Start to plan together. You guys can stay together in cheap hotels, or if you're gonna, if you're gonna drive in from California, it can be a day trip. We'll leave, at, leave at three in the morning, court at eight a.m., and then leave at nine again and go back to California. Or if you're in the Nevada area and it's only a few hours, leave at three o'clock in the morning, show up court at eight, go back. Anyway, I I love you guys. I'm sorry that I'm emotional, but this is the first free time I've got in 48 hours. So. Uh, I love you guys. I gotta call two more people before they're gonna. I only get one hour. I'm 45 minutes in. So uh, do me a favor, you guys. Please contribute to my GoFundMe because I have heavy legal bills, and uh, I have to. Uh, I gotta follow through on some. I got there's things I have to follow through on that I don't want to say on here because they listen to every one of my phone calls now. Love you all. Bye. The caller has hung up. Trolls are having a field day with what's going on with Delete Laws, Hendry, and Flex Your Freedoms. And it makes me wonder about the motivations of people who seem to love cheering on the violation of personal freedoms, including their own. When state and federal laws and the arbitrary commands of law enforcement officers run afoul of human rights and the articulated freedoms spelled out in the supposed supreme law of the land, it seems contrary to the fundamentals of self-preservation to continue supporting the addition of laws that erode more of our rights. At the same time, balance is key. It's easy to drink the Kool-Aid and get stuck in the trap of the cult of personality. No matter how much you may like and support someone, never allow them to jump in the front seat of your mind and replace truth and reason. Your allegiance should only ever be to that which is right and to those who do what is right. If a cop does wrong, it should be called out. If an auditor does wrong or acts foolishly or imprudently, it should be exposed. This is trial attorney Patrick Darcy, and he gives his professional opinion on whether Chile de Castro can overturn his two convictions on appeal. And before I play what he says, Chile's lawyer, Christopher Oram, has already requested a hearing and appealed and made a motion for bail or, in the alternative, a recognizance release. There is a hearing set for Monday, April 1st at 8 a.m., and I'm sure the trolls will have a field day with this date. Here's some of what Patrick Darcy believes will happen during the appeals process. Well, now that Chile has lost on his two counts and is in jail, let me just, what I think is going to happen with this appeal, because I think he will appeal. First of all, he's dead wrong if he thinks the appeal uh, will be decided within the next six months. No way. It's not a high priority case. It's a misdemeanor case. It's going to probably be a year and a half before it's heard, but he's not getting out in 30 days. No way. Also, uh, you know, they would know that he's a flight risk because of the uh, warrant that's out in Ohio that I'm told is out there. I saw that in a traffic stop. So um, getting him out on bond would be very difficult. He'd have to pledge collateral and security, especially with a bail bondsman thinking that he's going to abscond. So I think he's staying in jail. This is what he's talking about from publicdocuments.com. There are two active warrants issued by both the city of Oregon and the city of Ironton, Ohio. One is for criminal harassment. The other is for resisting trespass and disorderly conduct. In neither case is there a victim. No one was threatened. No property was damaged or stolen. Nevertheless, there are two active warrants which seems like it would diminish the likelihood of any kind of early release. What about the appeal itself? 
A lot of people have a misunderstanding of what happens with appellate process. First of all, he is going to need an appellate lawyer. Appellate law is a completely different animal than regular trial law, trial work that I do. Appellate court is going to look at errors in law, errors in admissible admissibility of evidence, testimony that was not supposed to be entered into the record. Uh, but before they get to that step, they're also going to be looking at whether or not the person complaining about it did what's called invited error. In other words, did they object on the record to this? If there was a, you know, this was a very short trial, so the record is pretty small. This right here is where Chili's lawyer might have hamstrung him. I don't recall a single objection from Michael Mee, but plenty from the prosecution. In the appeals process, they're just looking for errors in how the trial was conducted. Not about who lied. It's not about looking for any kind of evidence. They're looking for errors that affected the outcome. If not objected to during the trial, it's usually waived. And it looks like the hearing to get Chile out of jail will again be brought before Ann Zimmerman. So the likelihood that she'll grant that seems slim to none. I mean, bruised egos stay bruised for a long time. Let's just talk about what the judge did from an appellate point of view. From an appellate point of view, she said very clearly that she based her conviction on what she saw with the videotape. Now, was it a good idea for Chile to give the thumbs up and agree he hates all cops? She even said, look, he's nodding approvingly here. No, uh, it's never a good idea to antagonize a judge when they're handing down a sentence. In terms of the sentence itself, it's in the midpoint of what she could have offered. So I warned about that, and I also warned that they could string them together consecutively in my other video. You guys have all seen that. I, I went out and told you what I thought would happen, and it pretty much happened as I told you it would. Six months is a long time, okay? That, that shocked me. That was harsher than I was expecting. I mean, the DA wasn't even looking for jail time with a suspended sentence, and the judge looked at the DA like, you got to be kidding me. So... Did the judge abuse her discretion? No, you, you're going to lose on that. I'm just telling you, you're going to lose. And the reason you're going to lose is because the system and the people who work the system don't seem to be interested in justice. Habeas corpus may sound like a fungus growing in the flower bed in your backyard, but it has a deeper, more profound meaning. Literally from the Latin, it means show me the body. That is, the judge or court should and must have any person who is being detained brought forward so that the legality of that person's detention can be assessed. Was Chile's detention assessed in the light of fundamental rights or according to the accommodation of officer safety? I think we all know the answer to that question. In United States law, Habeas corpus ad subiciendum, which is the full name of what habeas corpus actually refers to, is called the great writ. And it is not about a person's guilt or innocence, but about whether custody of that person is lawful under the Constitution. Common grounds for relief under habeas corpus, relief in this case being a release from custody, include conviction based on illegally obtained evidence, a denial of effective assistance of counsel, or a conviction by a jury that was improperly selected and impaneled. Let's face it, habeas corpus has historically been an important instrument to safeguard individual freedom against arbitrary executive power. Yet people fall prey to that executive power every single day. The judge has wide discretion. Discretion isn't unbridled, as they say. There are limits to discretion. Uh, for example, uh, discretion does not allow her to commit an error of law. In California, for example, if you want to file a 170.6 motion to disqualify a judge, you have to do it within, I think, either 10 or 15 days of being served it. The other thing is, is that Chile's antics in the beginning of the case, calling the marshal a pig, judge could have held him in criminal contempt. Criminal contempt is any violation that's in front of the judge. But the judge warned him and decided not to. So that's going to count in her favor when people say she's biased. And wrong or right, perception is everything. 
that a judge even has the power in a courtroom to arbitrarily declare criminal contempt just because somebody voiced an opinion when there is no victim is sobering. And it should be sobering since most black robe tyrants are drunk on their own power. What I heard was basically uh, the lawyer arguing the defenses that Chile was going to offer, First Amendment defenses. Well, First Amendment defenses, those are pretty touch and go. I don't like those because this is a criminal case, not a civil case. And in a criminal case, you better have case authority like the judge asked for. You better have case authority that supports your position that this is an absolute defense to uh, the charge. Seems like there's plenty of case authority, not the least of which is Houston versus Hill. It's not uh, not easy to do in the criminal arena. And if you say, well, you know, and I saw people writing this, you know, uh, well, you know, you can't criminalize a constitutional right. Yes, you can. It happens all the time. Uh, I'll just give you some obvious examples. You want to yell bomb on an airplane? Good luck. Your First Amendment doesn't cover you in an airplane. Okay. You can't uh, yell fire in a theater. You've heard that cliche because it's true. There are limits to everything. There is no such thing as unlimited constitutional liberty. See, I disagree with this assessment because I think it's mischaracterized. There is unlimited free speech. There is unlimited right to keep and bear arms. There is unlimited freedom of press. But freedom stops the moment your freedom violates the freedom of another, which means there's no freedom to do that at all. Yelling bomb on an airplane or fire in a crowded theater is an infringement on the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness of others and doesn't fall into the framework of freedom. Not at all. I have no liberty to take another man's possessions just as I have no freedom to cause a plane or theater full of people to trample one another in a desperate attempt to find the exit to safety. The fire in a crowded theater argument is based on a statement of false equivalence. In other words, yelling fire or bomb in a crowded place is not the same thing as calling a cop a doggy at a policing for profit, corporately incentivized traffic stop. And I would think this attorney should know that. The constitutional test for you YouTubers out there that want to be lawyers, rational basis, any rational decision by the government will be good enough to, to apply it as long as it's applied in a neutral fashion. Next is, uh, you know, there's a mid-level scrutiny and then there's strict scrutiny. Strict scrutiny is anything that would impinge on a constitutional liberty and it has to be narrowly. And there must be a compelling government interest. I didn't hear any cases discussed in the, in the closing argument that would support a First Amendment defense. Now, Michael Meese said that he submitted them to the judge. It is in the record. The appellate court will do its own legal research and analysis on that. And there's the question of the admitted evidence. We only had two witnesses and only the cop was cross-examined. Chile wasn't cross-examined, which really surprised me. I mean, I would have had a lot of fun cross-examining him. In a way, I can understand him saying this. On the other hand, that seems like a partial statement. I mean, why wouldn't he say the same thing about Officer Bork who lied on the stand? I personally think cross-examining Bork would have been way more fun. Officer Bork, you've had years of professional experience and years of tactical training. You have a Kevlar vest on. You're armed. You have unlimited backup at your disposal. It's broad daylight. You can see that the man standing there has a camera and gives no indication that he's a threat in any way. You gave him two commands to stop talking to the driver and to step back. He complied with both Officer Bork, but you lied and said he didn't. Are you seriously going to sit there and tell anyone who's ever going to watch this video that you were so scared that you feared for your life? Are you that much of a snowflake that you can't discern that this guy wants to hold you guys accountable and that he has a great disdain for people who violate the law under the color of law? I thought you guys were the brave thin blue line heroes. Do you realize you only attempted to apprehend the cameraman after he called you a doggy? 
Yeah, cross-examining Bork would have been a whole lot of fun. But this attorney only mentions having fun with the guy who, while mouthy, while he may be arrogant, while he may be what some construe as an a-hole, he was only exercising his rights. But you'd only have fun cross-examining him? Love for you to explain that one, Mr. Darcy. So the appellate court's going to see, was the evidence competent? Was it admissible? Was it relevant? Were there any objections to it being admitted into evidence? And if not, how prejudicial was it? Would it affect the outcome? Next, there's a lot of other ways that you can admit evidence, even if you failed to object. Maybe there was a mistake and it shouldn't have been admitted, whatever. It doesn't change the fact that the parties that were in that tape were the ones that were narrating what happened. The cop was, yeah, that's me, that's him. Yeah, that's the distance, that's what I said. It's coming in in a different way. It's coming in through direct testimony. Anyway, the tape, even though it got admitted, there was enough there, I think, independent of the tape to still convict him. The next issue would be the constitutionality of the statutes themselves. There's an uphill battle here. Trial courts required to uphold the statute because it's been declared constitutional. I've already gone through all of that in another video if you guys have read and watched my videos. I gave you the cases, in fact, and I analyzed the cases. The Nevada Supreme Court has declared these statutes constitutional, and they have used officer safety as the primary motivation. So what did the cop do? He talked about officer safety. Now, there's a problem with what he said. He's given an inconsistent statement. He says that he, officer safety is the reason for the 21 foot rule, but at the same time, he also said he didn't think that Chile was going to threaten him, wasn't a threat to him, and that's why he didn't tag Chile with a more serious battery charge. So officer safety really wasn't the overriding concern here. And yet this is what Annie Zimmerman said prior to throwing a man in a cage for a half a year. The problem with the argument that your attorney makes is it completely fails to consider the safety of the officer and the safety of the driver. The officer doesn't know who you are and the driver doesn't know who you are. And you don't have any right to interfere with that officer doing his investigation and deciding if he wants to issue a ticket to this driver. But you did interfere with his investigation. You did interfere with his ability to do his job. You did put him in a position where he is concerned for his safety and the safety of the driver. Let me just say it from my perspective. I got a client who thinks he knows everything and thinks he's smarter than me. He's smarter than everybody in the room. And he's not, okay? All right, <laughs> he's not. Never would I tell a client, okay, you can take over the case and I'll just sit back and watch you. And if you have a question, I'll help you with that. Never. A person who is untrained in that is going to flounder. It looked to me like what happened was, is me was supposed to t uh, step down and Shirley was supposed to take over the, the case. But now the judge is coming back saying, no, I'm not going to allow that to happen. Now me's the first chair again. And now he's off balance because when he thought he was going to be sitting in the background, now he's in the front line. And I think he was very uncomfortable with the whole situation. I don't think that he showed, I mean, when he was crossing his arms, uh, you know, I don't think these are the arguments that he wanted to make, but he has to do what his client wants. Bottom line is, is that I don't see this uh, appeal working out too well. The deck is stacked. The Supreme Court would probably just simply punt back and say, we've already ruled on the constitutionality of these cases and that's it. And then force Chile to go to the Ninth Circuit. Now, if he goes to the Ninth Circuit first without trying to develop a record in the lower courts, in the appellate courts, then he has less of a chance for them to even hear the case because they turn down over 90% of the cases that are given to them anyway. I think the convictions are going to stand he does raise an interesting constitutional question because I do not like the statutes, but we'll just have to see. Uh, but he will definitely need legal representation for this because these appeals are difficult. And now that's what I've hired. So I, I, I need everybody's individual help. You know, I've, I've done the best I can to help others. And, and now at this point, I need, I need people to help me. I hope you guys can show up. And if you do show up, please be calm and respectful and and, 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 and remember, this judge thinks that we're a bunch of hoodlums and bad people, so don't let her keep that idea. Come in and look as nice as you can, but please come. Please, let's, let's try to get that courtroom packed. 
please, I beg you, to come.